Welcome back to the channel. So just to give you a little update, I haven't uploaded in about a month. I've been busy, we were at a trade show, and we've just been kind of getting ready for the construction season. Now with this illness going around, I, th I suspect that it's gonna impact the business quite a bit. So now all our staff's working from home, everybody's taking all their computers, workstations, uh, screens, everything, everything's from home now. So I reached out to Reddit and uh, asked everybody for some questions they might have for me. So in this video, I'm gonna go through and answer those questions. So question number one, do you ever turn projects down? What are some signs that you look for in a client or project from the start that might be a red flag? Do you ever get talked down on your fees? So in terms of answering those que that question, we're gonna break it down into three separate steps. The first part is, do we turn projects down? Yes, all the time, um, for multiple reasons. I made a video uh, about that as well. Again, if it's not a project that's in our wheelhouse, if it's not, um, if the client doesn't fit our relationship or, like profile, that's also not gonna work. And if it's just, we don't have the capacity, those are the three main reasons. Um, but the probably the most important one is if the client doesn't fit our client profile and um, it's not in our wheelhouse. That's something that we like to take pretty seriously. Uh, in terms of what are the signs we look for, so again, we it needs to be a client that would fit our relationship. Um, so it needs to be someone that we could kind of work with and uh, and go forward from. So if you want a little bit more information, check out that video and I'll try to answer most of this question. And do we ever get talked on our fees? Well, that one is is no. So unfortunately, like we this is not like a negotiation. We uh, we have a set. Uh, structure for all our projects based on the number of hours and everything else so everything's broken down like that so really we're, we're trying to be as competitive as we can but no we don't ever get talked down we try to get talked down to but we don't uh, we don't ever budge from our initial fees uh, the initial price that we put in is the best price that we can and we hope that uh, we get the job and sometimes if people could do it cheaper and then then great but again we, we as engineers don't uh, discount our services question number two what was the hardest part about starting your own firm well, that's a, that's a bit of a loaded question. I could do a full video on this, uh, kind of explaining the steps to do that. But really, the most the but really the hardest part was to um, essentially get clients. Uh, I had a pretty good track record in terms of the existing clients I was dealing with. Uh, but it was to you know with uh, with non competes and not competing against our uh, my previous employers. It was to make sure that we could uh, get new clients. And uh, so we diversified a little bit, went into a little bit of a different avenue. I used to do a lot of industrial work and we moved to more residential commercial. Uh, so that was, that was a good way of uh, diversifying. But again, uh, getting the clients is almost the hardest part when starting a business. What regrets do you have? What would you do differently if you were to start a business all over again? I wouldn't say I have any regrets. I think everything along the way has been a good learning lessons. What I would do differently is I, one of the mistakes I made was I tried to work from home and kind of start the business in my basement, and I think that was a mistake. I should have invested from the start in getting a proper office space with uh, just to be able to kind of distance myself. Um, again, something that I've learned is that working from home is, is very difficult uh, in terms of getting pro in terms of productivity. So being able to go to an office, have everything set up, and essentially turning it into a routine, um, that, that was the most uh, valuable thing I've ever done. Uh, when we moved into this office about two years ago, that was my product, my personal productivity just went through the roof. So again, that's something I wish I would have done from the start. I uh, would have tried to just spend a couple of bucks, uh, put it in the budget, and start from uh, for, from an office space. Next question: I recently got hired at a startup. I'll be graduating this May. Any tips or advice you could give recent grads whose goal it is to start a company one day? So my advice to recent grads is always to get as much information from the people around you as you can and always put in more than is expected of you. That means, you know, going the extra mile, like if you're working on a typical project uh, at the office, let's say, you should be going home and brushing up on those skills before coming back the next day. You did this in university, you took the time to learn the material, study for tests for free. So my advice to new grads is if you're not 100%, let's say you're doing a, a concrete project and you haven't done a lot of concrete lately, you should be going home and making sure that you're ready for the next day's work. It's like, a, it's to making sure your, your skills are sharp and that you're able to uh, consume as much knowledge as possible. If you're almost struggling with first principles on the job, you're gonna have a hard time learning the, learning the more advanced stuff from the senior people around you. I think it's gonna stunt your personal, uh, professional development curve. You wanna be, again, you wanna be focusing on getting as much of the uh, experience components from the senior people around you, as opposed to them teaching you first principles that you should probably already know anyways. How would you compare the workload of working a job versus running your own firm? Well, that's, uh, I'm sure as you can expect, the workload is a lot, there's a lot more work, but that's because I have new roles now. I'm not just an engineer doing design work. I'm taking into account the, uh, the, the finances, the sales, 
um, essentially the, the business relationships, all those things are essentially additional work. And unfortunately that comes with the territory. You know, you go from working 40 hours, which is pretty standard to working 60, but that just, that's part of it, right? I think in episode three of Day in the Life, I was showing that I, I was on the weekend and that just, that's, that's normal. This is just me personally. I, I'm a person who just likes to, to work a lot. But uh, at the end of the day, like you could, you could do exactly what I'm doing with uh, with a smaller scale and work your 40 hours. The only thing is, they'll scale the, the size and volume of projects you could take on. When did you hire support staff? Do you use outside consultants to review your work or bounce ideas off of? I hired support. So I hired my first employee about a year in after I had gotten a groove of things. I set up the proper procedures. Uh, the I set up the office essentially to be ready to accept uh, employees, um, and that's that was about a year in. Yeah. Um, and then in terms of, do I use outside consultants? Yes, all the time. I think, uh, I think you, you have to, right? You, you should almost be getting a second set of eyes on anything, uh, especially a lot of the restoration work we do. Some of the things, um, some of the different things that we see, it's almost good to get a second set of eyes because sometimes I may miss stuff or sometimes I may be too conservative. And again, if we, if we review that with another peer or somebody else, uh, that has equal experience then that's, that's the way to do it. So yeah, we deal with, uh, with consultants all the time. The last question is a long one. So did you have clients you knew would hire you before you started your own firm? How did you expand your client base once you started working? So essentially, yes, I had people that were lined up to deal with me uh, to start this. I had put everything in place to be able to just jump right into it so I wasn't kind of starting from nothing. Um, again, it's like when you open a store, you want to make sure you have things in your store that people are looking for. So I had certain skills um, that were, were very niche that a lot of people were seeing we're seeking. Uh, so that's, that's one thing I did. Um, and then I expanded my client base by essentially, you know, knocking on doors, uh, referrals, and uh, just doing good work. Like, uh, good work sells itself. So if you do a good job and you almost go above and beyond, you know, take the extra 10%, take the extra 20% to every project, and that is worth more than any sales or, or business development that you can do. How did you deal with the heavy cost of starting your own firm? Well, I had I'd been planning for this since I graduated school, so I'd been saving. I had been saving about every year since I decided to take the leap. So I had a little bit of a nest egg to be able to do this. I had budgeted everything out to make sure that I would be able to sustain this. So I did all that. Um, again, I had a very very solid plan before taking this leap and being able to grow this. Where I live in Canada, there's a lot of resources for starting businesses and learning a lot of the things that you didn't know before. So again, wherever you're at, if that's something you want to do, I would take the time, invest in yourself into being able to go out and figure out uh, what the resources are in your city or community, and then be able to go from there. Because economic development is something that's that's seen everywhere. So it'd be very, I'd be very hard pressed to believe that it's, there's none in your community. Was there a tricky issue on a project which you were out of your depth and didn't trust your own research on the subject matter? How do you handle not having the cumulative knowledge that comes with working at a larger firm? So again, we're a small company. We take on small projects. That's the number one thing. We don't take anything on that we're out of our depth. That's, again, that's something that I don't do. When I screen the clients, if I'm, right away I know if I'm, if it's within, within my wheelhouse or if it's not. If it's a small residential job where they're taking out a load bearing wall, sure. If they're designing a power plant, sorry, I, I just don't have that knowledge. And I'm very upfront with that upfront, uh, and I'm very upfront with that with the client to make sure that everything's communicated with them and they understand. Um, again, I we keep, to answer the second part of the question, we don't have the community of knowledge here. We just stick to what we know and what we do best, right? Essentially what I'm and the other engineer here are comfortable with. And other than that, uh, we just don't take the projects on. Uh, it's not worth the liability or the risk to the client and it just wouldn't be very ethical. So we stick to, again, our wheelhouse and that's about it. So as always, I hope you've enjoyed the video. I'll be doing a lot more. So comment down below anything you might want to see, um, you know, due to this, uh, this illness running around. So please subscribe to the channel if you don't want to miss anything. I would like to reach a thousand subscribers before the end of April. So let's try to get there.